bank. It's Orson Welles. Of course it is. I think it's time we talk. What is it the writer says? Tell the story you know. Hello, everyone. Make yourself to home, Mr. Mankowitz, or shall I call you Herman? Please, call me Mank. 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 This is Herman Mankowitz, but we're to call him Mank. Mankowitz. Herman Mankiewicz, New York playwright and drama critic, turned humble screenwriter, Mr. Hurst. This is a business where the buyer gets nothing for his money but a memory. What he bought still belongs to the man who sold it. That's the real magic of the movies. Thunder, lightning, blood, fire, religion. Help! Someone save me! All in one film. That's director proof. That's why I always want Mank around. I hear you're hunting dangerous game. God bless William Randolph Hearst. Ready and willing to hunt the great white whale? Just call me Ahab. Do come in. At this rate, you will never finish. You said 90 days. Well, said 60. I'm doing the best I can. I've put up with your suicidal drinking, your compulsive gambling, your silly platonic affairs. You owe me, Herman. Who do you think you are? You're nothing but a court jester. What I want to know is why you think of it. It's a bit of a jumble, the collection of fragments that leap around in time like Mexican jumping beans. Welcome to my mind, old sock. Him, I get. But what did Marion ever do to deserve it's this? It's not her. Not all characters are headliners. Some are secondary. You pick a fight with Willie. You are finished. Mayor can't save you. Nobody can. Especially the boy genius from New York. I removed any distraction, eliminated every excuse. Your family, your cronies, liquor. I gave you a second chance. You cannot capture a man's entire life in two hours. All you can hope is to leave the impression of one. Why Hurst? Outside his own blonde Betty Boop, you're always his favorite dinner partner. Are you familiar with the parable of the organ grinder's monkey? <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the 92nd Street Y Talks with my guest, Gary Oldman, uh, who has been here before. I think it was three years ago. And in the interim, you won an Oscar. So congratulations yeah. for that, yeah, for the darkest exactly. hour. But at the time that you were here last time, was Mank already in motion? When did that movie come to you? Uh, whew, let me think. Uh, when did we start? We started shooting, um, I think it was a couple of years ago now that it came, um, that it came through my, uh, my producing partner, um, uh, Douglas Abansky was in, uh, was in talks with, uh, David Fincher and, they were in the wings, so to speak, behind the scenes, um, talking the thing up. And um, uh, as it were, but baking, baking it. And then it was brought to me. Um, uh, yes, I think it's a couple of years ago. It, it's um, I've known uh, I've known David for it's got to be over 25 years. And we've known each other just as friends and sort of socially. And I thought because of that relationship that I might never really get to tick that box um, um, and work with work with David. Um, so it was uh, just a, a, a wonderful thing, um, not only you know, was this uh, a great, a great piece of material? I mean, one of one of the best scripts I've read in a very long time. But it was with, uh, but it was with Fincher. So, it, it, from the get go, from the very beginning, it was very exciting. Are you an old Hollywood guy? Are you sort of steeped in that lore, or did you have to really step into it and do? What was the research like for this? For you, well, 
Um, I'm, I'm, I'm 62, nearly 63, and I have seen a lot of movies in my, in, in my 62 years. And um, uh, seen a lot of old, old, old movies from the 30s and the 40s and the 50s. So I was I was familiar with 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 that world, um, but I I knew more about uh, Joseph Mankiewicz, which is the brother of of Herman, who, as you know, had this absolutely amazing illustrious career, um, and I only really knew the, the the Citizen Kane association with with Herman. So I, I didn't I didn't I didn't really know too much about Herman Mankiewicz, but what I, to my surprise and delight, what I found was that the material that I was reading around the script, um, in in terms of Mank, the man in the character, very much matched up with what was on the page, so. Um, uh, you, as you probably know, this script was written now, I think, nearly 30 years ago um, uh, by David Fincher's father, Jack Fincher. Um, and I uh, not only not only did Jack, uh, not only was he just uh, 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 loved movies, but I felt that he's he had really done his homework and that he had he had captured um, an essence of, of Mank on, on, in the script. So what I was reading and what I was, I, you know, and, and the role I was going to play and the words I was going to say on, in, in the script matched up very much with um, various research and materials that I was reading around the script. Is there one thing we haven't mentioned that which we should is this is a beautiful looking movie and mm -hmm. of course you have the cars and the clothes and, and you're in the moment but how is that for you to watch the film when it's completed in this super saturated black and white all of these beautiful cuts is that sort of it must be kind of a treat for you because you're just in it when you're filming but you don't have that perspective yeah you're not really um I mean, there are many, many things to take into consideration technically. So that was all that was all worked on uh, prior to um, the actors um, arriving, um, the camera, the just the whole just the whole technology of of sh shooting black and white, but digitally and not not on film, and then you have to. Uh, uh, consider the colors of the walls, the furniture, the clothes, you know, there are certain things that you can't use because, because they won't photograph. So you need, you need those, um, you, you know, you need those different shades of, um, of, of, as you say, of contrast and saturation, but you're not, uh, obviously the world is in color, so you're not, you're not conscious of shooting in black and white, but um, we we knew that David wanted it to be very sort of immersive. He wanted to transport you back to that era, um, and uh, so we knew that it was it, he was going for a, a, a look that was. I guess slightly film noir. Um, we knew that he was going to put a patina or, or some do some kind of magic with the soundscape. Um, he, he, he wanted a feeling that you um, that you were listening, watching this movie in an old uh, in an old movie palace, and you get that that feeling of the voices sort of bouncing off the back wall. So. Um, uh, technically, the film went through a, a, a huge process, but uh, it, yeah, it's really, really something to watch. And I'm, 
I'm, I'm sad not, not enough people have seen it on the big screen. Uh, I was re recently in London and it was showing uh, the Curzon Cinema in Mayfair for a limited run. And it was very close to the hotel. So one night we snuck away. Um, this is during COVID. So there, there were not, the, the cinemas were open, but we were all masked and there was social distancing. Um, and there, 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 weren't many, there weren't many people in the audience, but it was a real treat to see it on a, on a screen uh, 40 feet. You know, it was, it was quite, quite a, a thrill. Well, the fascinating thing about Herman Mankiewicz is that he is pretty much always the smartest guy in the room and frequently the messiest. How do you find, and of course you've played, you know, alcoholics and addicts on screen, and, but how yeah. do you find the balance of not just having a sloppy performance, because of course it's a meticulous performance, but you need to kind of be that elephant in the room as well, you know, or the buffalo, I should say, in the room. Yeah, yeah. Well... The uh, well, the film in in its in its writing, um, I mean, tips its hat to those those thirties forties movies. So um, uh, the the script is 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 your map, if 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 you like, uh, uh, and it. Uh, both, you know, emotionally, but also the way that it was structured, the paragraphs, the sentences, um, the way that we spoke in the movie, that was, I mean, that's very much on the page. And and Jack wanted to capture that, that old Hollywood feel. Um, in terms of uh, the, 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 the drunkenness, I mean, he is either drunk or he is suffering from a hangover. I don't think there are many scenes actually where Herman isn't either drunk or tipsy. Um, but uh, David would calibrate that, um, and occasionally, uh, occasionally he would he would he would call from the monitor, you know, um, less drunk. <laughs> <laughs> You have some good Charlie Chaplin catfalls in there. I yeah, I did. We did the 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 um oh my heavens, the scene that we shot at Glendale Station. It was uh, her the the scene where Herman arrives in the car. Charlie Lederer is waiting for him, and um, and I sort of stumble tumble out of the car and then fall on to the luggage. Um, we. Uh, we 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 did many many a long rehearsal and many 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 takes of that. It was um, for for the timing of the scene. Um, it both the actors and 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 uh, the background and and the actual car coming in and positioning with the camera move. All of those, uh, all of those elements had to uh, had to come together very smoothly, and um, I I do remember falling out of that car and onto that luggage many 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 times. I was I was a little bruised, I must say, the next day. You yeah. suffered for your art. It's okay. Yeah. Um, the relationships with women are so interesting in this movie because Mank is always witty. He's always on, but he seems to save a lot of his charm and vulnerability for, for the women that he comes, you know, w with his wife, obviously, and, and, and with Marion. And it's interesting because sometimes, even with Lily's character, sometimes, you know, it's, it's very much platonic and sometimes it's romantic, but did it seem like Mank had more vulnerability with women or was that just one more layer of his psyche maybe? Yeah, I think, well, it was very much in the writing to begin with, but he had, he was, he loved women and was absolutely charming and to them and charmed uh, by them. Um, I, I, I mean, 
you you read these books and you hear these stories and at the end of the day really it's all hearsay i mean we weren't there we don't know what what tr truly happened we weren't there for these conversations but by all accounts she was very relaxed with it i think that sarah uh, trusted him and um and he had these platonic uh somewhat flirtatious relationships with various women and actresses that he met um, along the way. Um, I don't, I honestly don't believe he was ever unfaithful or cheating on her. Um, and um, he loved women's company. And I think she, uh, Sarah was, was, was okay with it and, and um, accepted it. Um, he had a, a soft spot for Marion. He thought that she was very funny. Um, they're both uh, alcoholics, so that that often bonds uh, uh, people. Um, but by all accounts, he had, yeah, he he was 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 absolutely uh, a charm by women. And had and had um, uh, good 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 relationships, m m m more with the women than he did with the with the, certainly with the men. Um, I was going to say that yes, Irving Thalberg less charmed by Mank than many, and he has Irving has that scene, I think, with you where he just says he basically says, "Oh, the things you could be if you got out of your own way," basically, not not in that kind of a way. Not, not well, that way. yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, Herman, yeah, he was, he was in his own way. He got in his own way. Um, he came, uh, and like a lot of alcoholics, you know, there's always got to be someone that you can point the finger at. And that you can blame. You seem to always want to f uh, 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 find um, it, it, enemies in people. Um, Herman, uh, he came to Hollywood. He had aspirations, I think, of being um, a great playwright or a novelist, and considered both those up. Those those. Those he considered them as art; they were an art form, and uh, and playwriting, of course, had been around a long time. Uh, when he first came to Hollywood, he was writing uh, the cards for silent movies, and by the time he was right, he was uh, writing proper scripts. Um, you know, we have to remember that the the talking picture was in its infancy. It wasn't. It wasn't very old, um, even by the time that they'd made Kane. Um, you're looking at what ten years or something. You know. You know. Uh, and it was considered a lesser. It wasn't really even considered an art form. It was. It was. It, it was. It's certainly beneath. Herman. Um, so he felt that he had, the money was terrific and it was going to pay a lot more than you could as a copyist or a critic or um, a, a journalist, which he, uh, well, he certainly was a, 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 a second string theatre critic back in, back, in, back in New York. So the pay was very good. Um, he really did send a telegram to his uh, his his associates and buddies in in New York, saying, you know, uh, come out. There's millions to be made, and your only competition is idiots. So he thought that those that were working around him were were beneath him. And there's a very uh, there's a very telling quote by Mank. Um, he, he wrote that. He said, you know, you spend your life doing something that you hate and that you wake up one day and turn around and you're an old man. 
And I, I ultimately, Citizen Kane or American, as the original, as the original script was called, was his way of being remembered. A lot of what Herman wrote. He never got his name on. He wrote, he, he, he wrote quite a few films. He wrote for the Marx Brothers. He was very influential in The Wizard of Oz. It was Herman's idea to shoot Kansas in black and white and then have Dorothy step through into Oz and go into Technicolor, you know, sort of threw that over his shoulder as he was being fired and walking out the door. Um, his name never appeared on it. So there was a lot he did he, he never got credit for, and I don't even think he wanted credit for. He was quite happy to live a very, very good life, boozing it up, you know, earning, earning an incredible amount of money uh, doing it. And I think Cain was the thing that I think he felt, finally, I could leave something behind. Here is something that I truly can be remembered for and I think he was very very he was very he was very proud of it. Do you think he saw himself as a tragic figure? I mean does anyone while they're living particularly someone that that smart and that yeah self-aware in some ways very much not in other ways? Not so much a tragic figure um uh I mean, I, it, it, I mean, it's no secret um, because I, I mean, I don't live anonymously in that sense, but I'm a recovering alcoholic and now it's coming up. I mean, I've, I'm celebrating, soon to celebrate nearly 24 years of sobriety. Um, but I knew I had a drinking problem when I was drinking. I mean, you know, he, he, I mean, he would have known that there's there's always and there's always an excuse you procrastinate there's always um, an excuse to put something off or not buckle down um and uh you know he said a final draft was you know something that you put through the typewriter the night before that you have to deliver it i mean <laughs> you know uh i don't know if you don't i don't think you don't necessarily see yourself as a as a as a tragic figure but you are but you are aware that you're not necessarily reaching your full potential um when you're when you're in your cups there's there's this scene i want to talk about where um, you know, to, to sort of muffle or, or, or counter Upton Sinclair's message, they're making these propaganda films, and you're speaking to your friend who just who did it just because he wanted the chance, you know, to be a director. Yeah. And you, to paraphrase, essentially, you say, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. You're saying we have this power with film and people sitting there in the dark and it does seem very prescient, but then of course also it was written almost 30 years ago. Could you feel that in the moment, sort of? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, uh, what is it? Life, like, it's just life catching up with art. I mean, uh, I think there's always been what we now, what we now refer to as fake news. I think there's all, I think it's been around for a long time. Um, and it just goes to show that there it was it it it, it was um, it it was happening back then, and it's and it's just you know um, I think uh, you know when David first first worked on the screenplay, you know twenty eight years ago. Um, mm -hmm. You know that whole that 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 whole thing of the the, the the propaganda. You might a modern maybe he thought that a modern audience wouldn't necessarily understand or or, or connect to it in the way that that pe people can now. Um, yeah, 
it, he it, it, it's a slight it's a re, it's a realization for Herman in our version in our in our narrative um, uh, and and and, uh, and and he means it when he says yeah he we we do we actually I think I'm riding fluff and 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 working on these this these scripts uh, you know beneath that have sort of somehow are, are beneath me um, but he does he does realize um, the power of words because he really. Um, in that moment with Thalberg, he does sort of toss it off. It 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 really is an aside. Um, and uh, well, as, as you say, you know, always always the the smartest guy in the room, and that these people haven't even worked this out. You know, um, as he says, you know, you can make people believe that ten, King Kong is ten stories high. And that Mary Pickford's a virgin of 40. There's so many great sort of lines that he kind of tosses over his shoulder, or, you know, you know, through the side of a cigarette. And how many of those, do you know how many of those were documented and how many just came really from Jack Fincher? Oh, there's a lot of funny lines that are written by Jack Fincher. Yeah. Um, yeah, Herman is, he was one, he, he was a great one for the one-liner. What does he say uh, about Toto? And he says it sounds like a Japanese in The Wizard of Oz. He says The Wizard of Oz will never work because the dog has a bad name. Um, oh, yeah, which is, uh, you know, now is, it would be... Um, yeah, not acceptable. It, not, yeah, not, not, not acceptable. Um, well, a different... Uh, a, 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 a different age and a different era. I mean, even when, when, when they're shooting the uh, when they're shooting on the on the uh, it's Saint Simeon when they when they're doing the, the that that shoot with the the Western shoot, um, which is kind of the home movie that Hearst is putting together. I mean, you just see a whole r row of um, Caucasian men who are dressed up as Native Americans. So it was, a, yeah, it was a, a completely a, a different time. But I, I found a great many funny lines by, by Herman. And I, we had rehearsal. Um, we had like two, three weeks rehearsal where we meticulously went through the material and and did character work and and really examined the, the the script do we lose this does this make sense is is there a better word is is, is you know can we can we get there can we can we say that a little quicker i mean we really forensically went through the the script with david and i had found some funny quotes by herman and david said look you know, list them all, um, bring them in, and uh, uh, it, if we can find a, a place for some of them, then we can add. Then we can add them to the script. Um, one of the ones I found was um, uh, um, if uh, if I ever go to the electric chair, I'd like him to be sitting in my lap. Yeah. Was was one that that was one that came in uh, late in the day, and um, when he says the Writers Guild is in its infancy, it's in trouble. And Herman says, "You're telling me what what screenwriter failed to notice that Screen Actors Guild needs an apostrophe?" That's a real Herman line. A joke for all the copy editors in the room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there were, there were, um, yeah, there were a few that found their way in, but, but, well, as you can, as you can see, Jack um, is a very good writer, and he and he really he really could write he really could write a funny line that that I mean that goes back to what I was saying about the 
he captured an era. He, he captured uh, a sensibility and a, a, and a, a way of, 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 of speaking back then. It, it's quite, um, it, it, it's really quite remarkable for that. I was going to say, in a way, the, 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 the rhythms of the script, it almost sounds like a musical because it's so, there's sort of a jazz to the way that everyone speaks and the, and the cuts and the flow. Yeah. Well, it was a different kind of, um, it, it, a different kind of acting back then. And of course, all of that, all, all, all of that, changed with James Dean and Montgomery Clift and, 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 and Marlon Brando um, and they that school of acting um, Stella Adler um, at Strasbourg that 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 they turn the evolutionary wheel a notch with that with the, with that kind of approach although Stanislavski had been doing it for a long time, um, uh, so the so there was a particular style of acting, and you can see it if you uh, you look at Cary Grant. Um, I used to love as a kid. Um, I, I well, I still do. I like Edward G. Robinson, and uh, heavens, could he get through a sentence? Uh, and I would I I I I would have uh, I, I admired it so much, um, and I think I had uh, not necessarily not necessarily an advantage, but um, uh, an understanding of it coming in because of I think being classically trained, having having worked, uh, gone through a drama school training and then having spent time on the stage. Um, uh, Amanda is a very, um, she's very, well, she's luminous for a start. I mean, um, Amanda just has that quality for nothing. But she's very, um, very now and in, in the moment and very modern. Um, and uh, so that rhythm or that way of speaking uh, was 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 a, a little new to her. Pop, this is Harmon Mankiewicz, but we're to call him Mank. Mankiewicz, Herman Mankiewicz, New York playwright and drama critic turned humble screenwriter, Mister Hurst. Why? No need to be humble, Mr. Mankiewicz. Picture's the talk of the future. They're going to need people who honor words, give them voice. There's a golden age coming when all the world will be a stage. And you, perhaps, there's Shakespeare. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't have thought you'd be that keenly interested in the honoring of words. <gasps> What's so funny? I'm just surprised that a vaunted muckraker like yourself sees Hollywood's future as such a shiny penny. Back to what? Times are changing, Mr. Mankiewicz. And I'm not just referring to this depression. All that bothers me. When all this is over, picture makers are going to have to service this new entertainment. I intend to make pictures with the help of real literary minds. Let's support that. And instead, what do most studios give us? Gangster flicks. Zanies. Too true. Now, how many gangsters do Americans meet in a lifetime? How many families are like my Marx brothers? You mean besides my own? Ha! Very good. Now we're seated next to me. Miss Davies, Mr. Hurst would like Mr. Mankiewicz seated to his left at dinner. Oh, Pops likes you. You don't sort of act around the line. You don't act before the line, on the line, and after the line. You kind of do all the work. You live in the word. You live on the line, and that's what. And that is what you see when you watch those old movies. They're just. They're just really sharp, and and um, 
so that I think that that was um, uh, it, it was uh, a challenge for some of for, for some of the younger actors because they're used to a certain method or a certain style of acting, and this required something. David would always remind us, you know, articulation. He would say it's the 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 uh, the teeth and the tongue in conjunction with the lips. Well, we we have. I do want to talk about a couple other things with you, particularly um, outside of Mank. Yeah, you have. You've been in a couple of extremely beloved franchises, Harry Potter and Dark Knight, but are there any characters that you'd like to go back to from your career that are non-franchise? Maybe you'd like to revisit, I don't know if that would be, you know. I mean, for me personally, it would certainly be Drexel in True Romance, but of course he's no longer with us. <laughs> no, um, although that was, that was a, a, a fun, week of work it was only it was only a couple of days but my god that was fun um uh well i would like to i i could revisit smiley okay from tinker Taylor. um there is i mean there's he runs he's in in many of the books but there's there is um uh the the follow-up, which is Smiley's People. Um, so that would be a character that I could, that would certainly be a character that I could revisit. Um, uh, Sorry, I mean, I'm there's a lot of, that, no, there's a lot of things I think I would like to go back and redo. <laughs> <laughs> if I could have another, if I could have another sort of crack at it, um, uh, but that that's that's my own that that's my own insecurity and my that's all my own baggage. There's nothing to do with the people who who uh, love these movies and 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 like these performances. I think um, you know I once read that. Uh, if John Lennon had 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 his way, he would have he would have burned most of everything he did, and then re-recorded it. And he would have just burned it all and redone it. Um, I thank thank heavens he didn't do that. But I I can I understand that. I I I heard that and I thought yeah, yeah we could just burn it all and start over. Well, what about directing? Because of course, No By Mouth, which was such a personal film. Mm -hmm. Did you feel like that was a movie that you wanted to make and otherwise you don't feel this burning need to be a director or what's your well, take on that? Well, I don't, uh, it's, that's, a, that's a strange one. I don't earn my living, I don't earn my living from, from um, directing. And I have written many other screenplays um, and have tried to get them made unsuccessfully. Um, I have one now that's that's ahead of the others that is something I've been working on. Oh, I think I started writing it like eight or nine years ago. Yeah, um, we shopped it around. It, it, I'm very proud of it. it it's, um, it's a period film. It's set in the, uh, it, it, well, it crosses time, but it's, but it, it's set in uh, 1870. Um, and uh, it, it's quite a big film. Uh, the, the budget is not extravagant, but um, it's, it's period. So it, it, it makes it a little more uh, harder to, to make. Well, certainly in the, in the, in the sort of um, in the studio world, now that we've got um, uh, the, the streamers, I mean, you know that David 
I mean, obviously tried to make Mank, um, I think in 97. Um, and uh, the studios at that time had these uh, uh, f uh, foreign deals with various people and, and there was always restrictions, you know, on, on the delivery. It had to be, you know, under two hours and it had to be in colour. Um, and he had always seen the film um, in, in black and white. And um, I don't know, partly because of that, I think maybe just just getting the money together or finding a home for it was, was, was hard. And so he put it back on the shelf um, and then along comes Netflix, who just says, we we know this is very, you know, what do you want to do next? And he gives them Mank and they say, this is very interesting. And, um, you know, we don't have a problem of black and white. Um, so and you're David Fincher, so go ahead. Yeah, and you're David Fincher. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so, so you know, um, go for it. But uh re regards to my my current uh screenplay uh yeah we may we may end up finding a home for it but so i've 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 actually tried to direct in 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 the past uh i've got occasionally i've got very pregnant with the with the with the projects and then for one reason or another they haven't happened um so we'll see i um because i don't make my living from directing there's there's less pressure on me um i've worked with some directors that um you know that's how they make their money and they have this you know this need to, to to work and make movies and i and I, I i understand that and sometimes there's a danger of signing off on a film or signing off on a budget um and then you and 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 then you start to sort of run into trouble then you then you start have to cutting corners and compromising and um, you know, losing pages, uh, it, it, and I, um, because I don't have that pressure. I I have budgeted the film. I know how much I need really need to make the film. I'm not I'm not being greedy, but uh, <laughs> I I I I know how I want to do it. And if uh, if I can't find enough money then I'm, I have the luxury of being able to earn a living acting. And so I can put it back on the shelf. So it may be made, it may not. Um, it would be a nice thing, be a nice thing to do. So since you hadn't yet won an Oscar when you were here last at the Y, is there, so you're one of the very few people in the world who has won one. When you do, is it kind of like, yes, I have made it to the mountaintop, is there a satisfaction and a calm and a sort of, or does that just kind of make you want to go out and do more and get another one and keep climbing? Um, well, I'm looking for bookends. <laughs> it's, a de it's a decorative thing, that's all. Yeah, just, just the interiors thing. Yeah, I don't know. Um, how do you, well, it is an incredible, it, as you say, there's only so many people on the planet that that, that have them, and uh, so it is. Uh, it, it really is. Tr it's truly a great honour to 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 be recognised in 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 that capacity. Um, it just generally with people are out there and they're seeing the work and they're liking the work. That is a wonderful, that, I mean, that's, that's really a wonderful thing in itself. Um, yeah, to win, to win the Oscar, it was, um, I, I was, uh, it's thrilling. Yeah. And um, I can't say, you know, when, when, 
I don't know when you when you maybe when you don't have one and you're not in the running. I think you you know it's easy to sort of say, ah, oh, well, you know, whatever. Does it really does it really mean anything? Does it really matter? Um, in the in the in the huge in the big scheme of things, I don't know. I, it's awfully nice to have one, and to have been recognised by the academy. Um, uh, but no, you're not thinking. Um, no, you don't think. Oh well, I've reached the 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 summit, and really f f thereafter, do you do do you think? Oh well, now well, now I need two. Now I've got to get the next one. I don't. You know, you don't really think like that. Life life moves on pretty quickly. Um, you are when when you're in when you're in the thing. It it feels like it's just it, it's it, it's everything, um, um, and and it's coming at you it, it, like an express train every day. I mean, it is literally the it's the air that you breathe. It's Oscar, 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 or or the awards season or the campaign, and then it culminates in this big event, and it's really wonderful, but. Um, you know, and it's uh, you have to pinch yourself the next morning when you see it sitting there. <laughs> you go, you know, cool, blimey, I got an Oscar. <laughs> you know, and then life moves on, and then life moves on um, well, pretty quickly. You've played, you know, Bram Stoker, Dracula, Lee Harvey Oswald, Winston Churchill. I guess it's just, is there some sort of white whale for you? Is there any role that you still either, that you just know that you, you can do or that you think maybe even now you had to wait to do? Maybe you needed to be older for. Is there anything out there? Well, I never, well, I never knew Herman was out there. Okay. Until it sort of dropped in. Uh, and I really, like I said, you know, I knew more about Joseph Mankiewicz than I did about Herman. And then you start to find out about Herman and you go, hell, this guy's, wow, this whole story behind the Citizen Kane is really, really interesting. And what a, what an, what a fascinating, complex guy this is. And, um, I mean, here, here, here's it, it's a funny thing. Um, uh, a few people, a few people commented that I that I'm older than Herman, and it's a funny thing. Um, I don't think that David was concerned about height, weight, age. If he f feels that you've got those qualities that he's he's looking for, then he's he, he's not he's not worried about. That he's not worried about the fact that I don't really look anything like Herman Mankiewicz. You know, he he's so he's not concerned with those things. But I know a few people mentioned it and they sort of said, well, Herman was 43 and you're what was I, 60. So um it was a hard 43 though, let's be real. Yes, that's the thing. It he he needed a certain gravitas that does come with experience and with, with age. Um, but there's a photograph of him with Orson Welles in, I think, 1940-41. Herman looks 75. Um, he, he, I mean, so it, uh, the booze had really, really taken, taken its toll. So, uh, so that was, um, uh, you know, that was that that. Funny enough, that was never really a concern. Um, you know, scripts come in and you go, "Am I really right for this?" Or "I'm too old for this?" Or they need they need a no. They they really do. I c I could play down, but I can't play. I can't play that far down. Um, th this one wasn't. Um, this one wasn't a, 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 a worry in that way, but 
it did just kind of drop in and you go, ah, oh, here's someone now I can, there's another interesting person I can investigate and play. Uh, so there's no one really, um, I think I had a good, I had a good Hamlet in me. And that's that when that door is closed. So uh, I, I, I think I think I had a good one in there, uh, but I can't think of. Um, as I say, I'd like another. I, I would I would like another go. At, um, Smiley, George Smiley. Uh, a nice tribute to John Le Carre since we lost him last year. Yeah. Um, yeah, he was a um, very love, love, sweet man um, and a wonderful raconteur. Oh, he was absolutely um, a lot funnier um, than when I met him than I'd imagined him being. He, he had a great, great, great sense of humour. Um, yeah, so we'll see. Maybe there's something, maybe there's something really interesting out there that will that will float my way. Well, Mank is streaming on Netflix, and thank you so much for being with us here at the 92nd Street Y for this talk. This was wonderful. Yep, yeah. my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you.